this is I don't know, we have many we have many student seminar and this is the turn of Sebastian Bukta that he is gonna talk about numeric implementation of the loop tree duality method and as you know the idea is to make a lot of questions which is for us I mean for him it's for practice and for us it's also to learn how to make questions and don't feel ashamed for doing all the questions. So Okay, yes. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm indeed going to talk about this, which is pretty much the work of my PhD that you're going to see here. And this has been carried out with uh, the people here. Herman Rodrigo is my research supervisor and uh, the others are PhDs that I worked with as time went by. Okay, so this is a short outline of my talk. I intend this to be divided into three sections. First, I want to shortly state where we are right at the moment. Then I want to introduce the loop tree duality method, which is a new method for higher order calculations, and then show some details on the numerical implementation that we have realized here in Valencia. Okay, so at the moment, when you want to go and calculate next to leading order or even next to next to leading order, cross sections then what you always do is you calculate the tree amplitudes uh, tree corrections and then the loop corrections separately and as you have many external legs things become difficult quickly now there has been progress uh, in order to attack this and nowadays you have the selection among a wide variety of methods the OPP method unitarity Mellenbahn sector decomposition and many more of course now <coughs> The advantage of these methods is that now it's possible what 10 or 15 years before had been impossible, namely doing these uh, NLO and NNLO calculations. But still, what you have to do is cancel infrared singularities, which is not easy. And even then, there are additional difficult difficulties that arise from threshold singularities that cause numerical instabilities. And this is exactly where the loop tree duality method comes in because it's a method that has as its goal to combine the loop and the tree contributions and calculate them at the same time simultaneously in a common Monte Carlo. So how is this done? Now here, what is drawn is the most general one loop graph that you might think of with the loop momentum L1 and then the internal momenta are the QI and the external momenta are the PI. And then when you want to calculate this graph, you have to calculate the integral over all the Feynman propagators that are there. And the convention that we use is such that the internal momenta are the loop momentum plus all the external momenta up to the ith. And then this notation is also used in order to hide a couple of integration constants. <coughs> and now this is the basic idea that is at the heart of the loop tree duality, which is carrying out the L0 integration and you choose a contour that goes here th uh, through the lower half plane and this way you enclose all the singularities with negative imaginary part and positive energy. And then you employ the residue theorem to carry out this integration and then you say okay I have to take the residues at all these uh, singularities and evaluate what's left over at the value of the residue. <coughs> so first, when you are going to take the residue of the ith propagator, you will then see that you can actually rewrite it in terms of an integral over a delta function. And the subscript plus here indicates that you are going to take the positive energy solution of what's in there, of the argument here. And then we have all the other final propagators that are left over, which then have to be evaluated at the ith pole. And when you do this, you can actually rewrite them in such a form, which is very similar to the Feynman propagator. Just you can see the main difference is here that this I0 prescription is now modified. It's changed. It has picked up this extra factor, <coughs> which it basically serves as a bookkeeping of the sign of the, I0, of the standard I0 prescription. So this vector eta here is a future-like vector which with these properties and uh, it, eta itself is a frame-dependent quantity but once you bring all the dual contributions together you get something that is then of course 
frame independent. And then we call this new guy here dual propagator. <coughs> and then you bring all the intermediate results together. This, is, uh, this comes from the propagator that, was, that we took the residue of, and these are the other ones. And then this tilde is used to hide a couple of extra constants. And then you could translate this result back into the diagrammatical language. This is our one loop uh, graph that then gets transformed into a sum over all the residues that we took of a thing th where one line is cut because it's now replaced by delta and all the other internal lines are promoted to dual propagators. <coughs> so let's do a quick recap. So what we have seen so far is that the loop tree duality method converts standard one loop uh, integrals to a sum of tree level objects and these are sim uh, single cut. And the price that we have to pay for only having sim single cut dual contributions is that we get this modified I0 proscription. Uh, and then we have, of course, the number of single cut dual contributions that we have in our sum is exactly equal to the number of external legs because we have, from one loop, as many external legs as we have internal lines. <coughs> and then all the singularities that we might have in our original one loop integral will reappear as singularities of the loop integral. And this is in particular a nice, proper, uh, a nice property when you have tensor integrals, you can still go and straightforwardly apply the loop tree duality method because it acts only on the, on the denominators of your one loop integration. And you don't have to worry there. And actually, I'm going to present results on this later, towards the end of the talk. <coughs> and now we have seen uh, the way in which uh, this is realized to, to recast the virtual corrections in the form that is si similar to the real ones. Okay, and then you might ask, okay, fine, so we have one loop covered, what do we do at two loops? Is there a possibility to lift this concept to two loops? And the answer is yes, there is. And first we need to pick up a little bit more notation, so <coughs> what we do is we organize our external momenta into groups. So here in this graph, again, is the, the most general two-loop graph that you might think of. We take all the external momenta, meaning from P1 up to PR, to be this, meaning this, this right arc is uh, then the momentum group alpha 1 and the left arc is alpha 2 and the middle line is alpha 3. This is basically what is written here. <coughs> and then we have to, uh, to specify what is the Feynman propagator of a group of, of, a, of a set of momenta. And then we define this to be just uh, simply the product of all the Feynman propagators. And we define a similar thing for the dual propagator. So what is the, set, what is the dual propagator of a set of momenta? Well, it's just the delta and all the other duals. And then we sum over all the momenta in the set. And with this extra noti uh, notation in force, <coughs> we can basically say, well, if we have uh, a union of the sets of momenta and all of these belong to the same loop, then the duality method from, from the one loop, the, the result that we already derived, tells us basically that we can straightforwardly go ahead and rewrite it in such a manner. And now the basic idea is to go and subsequently apply the duality to all the loops. We start with one, apply it there, and then go through our loop diagram and apply to every single one of the loops until there's none left. Come back. Okay. Sorry, a question? Yeah. When you make this extension to two loops, does it is important how you arrange the external legs or, or is no matter, I mean, independent of the... What do you mean by arrange? I mean, because maybe there is a, a, a loop that is better in you arrange in uh, such a way that then you can describe better the propagator inside the loop so by this summing of momentum or is irrelevant? I mean, no, I, I don't think this is... If you interchange legs in this loop, yes. you obtain the same result for the, with the same method or you have to take care of how are 
these legs, this, you know, because this is as abstract, let's say, representation, yes. but when yes. you go to the real calculation, not all the legs are connected with all the propagators that are inside the loops. I don't know, I don't know it's just a, a curiosity. Um, well, I don't have, have a good answer on this, but in principle, there shouldn't be a difference, right? And, and uh, frankly, I don't, I don't expect one to be, but th the truth is, I, can, I don't know. Yes, yes. <coughs> so, there are a couple of more subtleties to it. Uh, first, when we are going to apply duality to one loop, <coughs> then every time we apply it, we get, of course, a single uh, cut. We already have seen this in the one loop case, and for two loops, for example, you would get then uh, two cuts in total. And uh, by this, we are going to cut all of the loop lines such that we are opening up the loop diagram to a tree diagram. And then there's another subtlety. For example, if we are going to apply duality here, then all of the involved uh, Feynman propagators will be converted to dual propagators. And then we have, for example, here this middle line. And since the middle line takes part in both loops, before we can go ahead and apply duality also on the, on the, left loop, uh, um, on the right loop, we will need to convert back these dual propagators as Feynman to Feynman propagators, and then we can uh, apply it again here. And for, the for this two-loop graph, this has been done, and uh, the result is what you see here in the red box. Mm -hmm. And you see that there are always two dual propagators in each of the contributions, which means that we get a, a, an object which is cut twice. And of course, this is a systematic procedure, which means you can easily go ahead and apply it to higher order loop integrals. There's noth nothing stops you from going through the, the, your diagram step by step. <coughs> and then you might say, okay, so we have higher order loops. What is about higher order poles? Because at one loop, <coughs> you can always choose a gauge that uh, allows you to have only simple poles in your diagram. But what is about, let's say, at two loops, you cannot avoid double poles anymore. So what do you do? So what you could do, and the, the first approach that you might go for is you say, okay, I go back, I redo the, I do my contour uh, integration, <coughs> and this time I won't employ the formula for the residues for, for simple poles, but for double poles. And while this is possible, there is actually another method that is more practical, and this is using integrations by part relations. Let's say we have a M loop uh, scalar integral with some dominate, uh, denominators d1 to dn raised to some powers a1 to an. Then <coughs> we pick up this notation where, where we rewrite it as, a, or let's say express it as a function of only the exponents a1 to an. And then we know, of course, that the total derivative of this thing integrated over equals zero. And then when we execute this derivative, <coughs> what we will get is we will either raise an exponent or leave it unchanged. <coughs> and then we also we might have contractions of loop momenta with external momenta. And what you usually do is you go ahead and re-express it in terms of some of the denominators that is already there. But this might not always be possible. In this case, you end up with something that is then called irreducible scalar product. And to fit this into the concept, you treat it simply as an extra propagator with a negative exponent. So let me give you a very simple example of how this is intended to work. Let's say we have here the easiest two-loop graph where a double pole occurs, namely here. Then you would have the, these denominators, L1, which is here. L2, which is here, the double pole, and then L3, which is the left arc, and uh, not L, D, D3, and D4, which is the middle line. So in this case, our, the corresponding function that we would assign to it would be 1, 2, 1, 1, 0. This guy here is 
one of these irreducible scalar products that I just talked about, but it doesn't occur here yet, so we get here a zero, and the two here at the second position indicates where the double pole sits. What we want to do now is reduce this two to one. And we can do this by considering these total derivatives. There are uh, a total of six, <coughs> and uh, they will produce a system of six linear equations that we are going to solve then. And the solution is quite simple to it. Actually, we can see that the F12110 can be rewritten as F11110 with some prefactor to it. And this is really nice because this prefactor is known. And this guy here on, on the right is also known because here we can employ all the formula that we already have. So there's nothing new. So we reduced a case that we didn't know to a case where we know everything. <coughs> and uh, of course, more complicated cases have already been treated and um, we used the Mathematica package fire there. And also an important uh, conceptual thing here is that when you do this reduction, you don't have a certain <coughs> integral basis in mind to which you reduce, but instead you're just going to reduce until you get rid of higher order poles, meaning until you're back to simple poles and you can use all your formula that you already have. Once you're there, you're happy. Okay, so next we are going to look at the singularities that occur in our loop integrand. So what is drawn here on the left is a two-dimensional dimi slice of the loop momentum space, which with here the spatial and here the time axis. And what we see here is a three propagator setup and the hyperboloids of the propagators are drawn where they become zero or where their denominators become zero. And the dots here indicate the origins or the foci of these propagators and these sit at minus ki. So just to remind you, ki was what we picked up in the beginning. It's just the sum of all the external momenta from one to i. <coughs> and um, the, the forward hyperboloids are in solid lines and the backwards in dashed lines. And now loop tree duality would mean that we integrate along all the forward cones. This is because as we derived this right in the beginning, we said we are going to close our contour on the lower half plane and then we pick up all the uh, residues with po uh, the, the singularities with positive energy. And this is why we int integrate along the forward cones, because we're at the positive energy. <coughs> and so when two of these uh, hyperboloids intersect, we have a singularity. And there are basically two types. One is this uh, singularity where a forward and a forward hyperboloid intersect. And uh, we don't have to worry too much about this type of singularity because <coughs> we actually hit it up twice. Once, for example, let's consider this guy here. Once we integrate here along this purple uh, hyperboloid, then we pick it up once and then a second time here. And now the nice thing is when you remember that a propagator is positive on the outside and negative on the inside, then you see the first time that we are going to hit it up, we are going from the outside to the inside and then the next time we are going from the inside to the outside of the other respective hyperboloid. This means that we pick up this, hyp this singularity twice, once <coughs> with uh, one sign and then another time with the opposite sign. And wh when you add up all the dual contribution contributions, this will cancel out. But then there's a second type of singularity and these come from the intersection of a forward with a backward hyperboloid. And these do not cancel out, which means that we then have to deal with them by contour deformation. <coughs> so, but before we go there, we pick up some, some extra conceptual stuff. So let's look at the dual propagator here. One important thing is that you can actually rewrite it in such a form that we rewrite it as a difference of squares. With, uh, uh, with uh, QI is the on energy as indicated here and KIJ is the difference of two internal momenta. So we can see here two things. First, 
as I said, it's now a difference of squares, which, is, which will become important in a second. And next, as it's written here, it's only a three-dimensional thing. So the actual integration that we have to carry out is in fact only three-dimensional, not four-dimensional, which is an advantage, because it's less complicated, obviously. So now, since this is a difference of squares, we can set it to zero and then use the third binomic formula to pull it apart. And this is exactly what you do, and you get two solutions, of course. And uh, the first solution here corresponds to a forward-backward hyperboloid intersection, and it basically describes an ellipsoid. And for this equation to be fulfilled, you see that kji0 has to be smaller than zero because these other two guys are strictly positive. <coughs> and uh, the condition for such an intersection to occur is when the two corresponding hyperboloids are separated in a time-like or for mass zero in a light-like fashion. And this is basically expressed here, and you get a correction term due to the masses here. And then the other equation here is, corresponds to the forward-forward intersection, and um, <coughs> the solution to this equation is a hyperboloid, <coughs> and it corresponds to a situation where the two propagators are separated in a space-like or for mass zero in a light-like fashion. And for the second equation, since there's a minus here, we have no restriction on the energy component of KJI. <coughs> and thus, you get this condition here. Again, a correction term due to the masses. <coughs> okay, so in case you have mass zero, your hyperboloids will degenerate to light cones. And then you have two possibilities. Either they are distinct from each other, or they, they are exactly tangential, which is what we see here. And if they are exactly tangential, what happens is that here all the way and here all the way where they overlap, since it's a forward-forward intersection, all possible singularities that sit there will cancel out. <coughs> so actually, the space where singularities might occur is restricted to the forward-backward intersection, which is then only here indicated by the thick red line. So, and this is really nice because what you can take away from here is that the space in which your singularities can occur in, in loop momentum space is restricted to a finite region. And this can then later be mapped to the real phase space emission. <coughs> but now back to, to the general case. I want to introduce another concept that will become important in a second, uh, which is <coughs> Let's say we have a box, then we have four of these Feynman propagators that we are going to integrate over. And let's say this is just a schematic way of expressing things. Let's say we apply loop tree duality. Then what we end up with is four contributions. And let's say for the first contribution, what we do is we cut the first propagator and all the others get promoted to duals. And for the second one, we cut the second propagator. We I indicated this by delta and then all the others get promoted to dual propagators, and so on. You get four contributions like this. And then you could go ahead and use the scheme to, oops, uh, to indicate the location of your singularities. And I have then here, here an example. So <coughs> the hyperbolic singularities have the H, and the other uh, ellipsoid singularities, the forward-backward type, are indicated with a capital E. And what you first see, of course, is that on the main diagonal, since there are the delta functions, you can't have any singularities, so there are zeros. And then the hyperboloid singularities are distributed symmetrically around the main diagonal. And this is no accident. When we just go back here, we see that this is the equation that indicates where the hyperboloid singularities occur. And we see that this equation is symmetric in i and j. And then what the index i does, it counts dual contributions. <coughs> and what the index j does is it counts propagators within the dual contribution. And when we now go back, we see that, let's say, if we have a hyperboloid sing singularity at position 1, 2, then we will always have the, the other one at 2, 1, due to the symmetry of this equation. And of course, also what, what we have is, let's say, for the ellipsoid singularities, 
we had this extra condition where kji, the zero component of it, had to be smaller than zero. Since, let's say, this is fulfilled for ij, it cannot be fulfilled for ji because kji was the difference of two internal momenta. So if we just flip the indices, then we will also flip the sign, which means that wherever we have an ellipsoid singularity, its mirror counterpart will guarantee to be zero. Mm. Okay. And there's actually, uh, why we do this, there's actually an impact on, on the contour deformation, and this is why we do this. <coughs> For example, let's say we want to deform contribution three, then we would say, ah, okay, so we need a deformation that accounts for these two singularities. And then th for this singularity doesn't uh, worry us too much because it cancels anyways. But we want that these cancellations of, singular of hyperboloid singularities should be preserved, which means that contributions that feature the same hyperboloid singularity must feature the same deformation. This means that the deformation of this and this contribution has to be the same. And consequently also this and this contribution. This means that these three contributions are coupled together by virtue of their hyperboloid singularities, which then means we need one deformation that accounts for the ellipsoid singularity at position 3, 1, 3, 4, and 2, 4, <coughs> and we apply it here, here, and even here, although there might be no ellipsoid singularity here but still we need to put it there because otherwise we, uh, the, our constellations won't be intact. And then since this uh, contribution isn't coupled to any other of the dual contributions, we can simply uh, deform it without uh, worrying. And since there are no singularities here, we can just go ahead and integrate without doing anything special. So what in general what we take away from here is an algorithm you first have to analyze your dual contributions, look where the hyperboloid singularities are, and then you group the dual contributions together. <coughs> and um, each of these groups will then be deformed independently from the other with a deformation that accounts for all the singularities, the ellipsoid singularities happening in the, in the group. Now what we have here is a, an illustrative example that I have uh, plotted here. We are looking at loop three momentum space and at the actual shape of the singularities in three dimensions. So here I have a triangle and each of the boxes represents one dual contribution. And so for example, here we see in the first contribution there's one hyperboloid singularity, which is this one here. And then in the second one, it's, it appears again, of course, which is here. And then the bubble is the ellipsoid singularity. <coughs> so, okay, contour deformation. Just as a quick reminder, in general, let's say when you have contour deformation, uh, by the way, one plus one dimensions here means one time and one space dimension. So in one plus one dimensions, let's say we want to integrate this function here, one over Lx squared minus e squared plus i zero. This will have, of course, two, <coughs> uh, sing two poles, which are here the, the two dots. One of them is sli placed, displaced slightly above the real axis and the other is sli slightly below. But we cannot integrate along the real axis because, because otherwise we would pick them up. So what you do instead is you construct a contour deformation, which is basically your usual momentum plus some imaginary thing. <coughs> and here you choose, of course, this thing in a clever way so that you go around the, uh, the poles in such a way that you go below the pole which is displaced slightly above and above the one which is displaced slightly below, as seen here. And the, the lambda here is a scaling parameter that allows you to control the height of your deformation. Okay, now what do we do in one plus three dimensions? Because things are a little bit more complicated there. Actually, there is a set of conditions that any contour deformation must satisfy. And the first thing is that you have to respect the sign of the I0 <laughs> prescription of your propagators that are involved. <coughs> and since in general a contour deformation looks like uh, L goes to L prime, which is then L plus some I kappa, where kappa is usually a function of the loop momentum L, 
<coughs> then in this case, for us, we are going to look at the on-shell energy because let me just remind you that our dual propagators look always like this and they have the on-shell energy here and here. And this is basically just a constant. <coughs> so if we look at this, uh, we plug in the deformation and then we see, aha, uh -huh, so for uh, here we have the imaginary part, so for this to match with the I0 proscription, <coughs> we need to have the scalar product kappa dot i to be smaller than zero. And then the other, uh, the other condition is that we of course want a deformation that doesn't change the value of the integral, obviously. But in order for this to happen, we want our deformation to fall to zero once we approach infinity in loop momentum space. <coughs> and so what we use, so this is basically our kappa function here, which is made up of two building blocks. The first one is what I call the vector part because it determines in which direction uh, the contour deformation points because since we are in three dimensions now, the contour deformation is a three-dimensional vector. So, and so what we take here, okay, this is not, this is barely readable. So these points here are basically the, the origins of the involved propagators. And the line here is the ellipsoid singularity. And then what we see here is, this is the, the first vector here, which points in this, and the other vector points in this direction here. And this is the point in, in consideration. And since we divide by its absolute value, we scale it back to one. And then when we add the two vectors, we basically take the resulting vector. And now this resulting vector, due to the construction like this, <coughs> has its angle with QI, with, with which is this vector here, which is always smaller than 90 degrees, which means that the <coughs> scalar product of this kappa times QI is always positive. And then when we choose the lambda IAJ, always negative, we have the first condition satisfied. <coughs> and then there's this second factor, which I call suppression, suppression factor. And here we have a plot in one plus two dimensions, because we cannot plot in three dimensions. <coughs> and what we see here is, is, again, only this factor. And this goes to one here, where the, this crater line is exactly this singularity ellipsoid. So it, the deformation gets switched on where the singularity is happening and is then suppressed everywhere else. <coughs> okay, and then once you put things together, what I have plotted here and here is again in one plus two dimension, the full kappa function. And since in one plus two dimension, the deformation is a two dimensional vector, what I plot here are actually individual compo components. So we can see again this uh, shape of going up and down, which we saw on, already in the one plus one dimensions. And then <coughs> the, yeah, which is basically here mirrored. <coughs> and well, just a small comment. Uh, it might seem that there's, let's say, no deformation here at the, at this uh, horizontal line here. But since this is only the X component of our vector, when we look at the same horizontal line here, we see that there's just no deformation in X direction, but there is still is a considerable deformation in Y direction. So, do not get confused. Okay, and then the procedure is such that you, for every individual ellipsoid singularity that might occur in your group, you pick up uh, this factor here. This actually features two parameters. One's, one is this lambda, which is a scaling parameter, and then we have the parameter aij, which is the width of your deformation. And of course, for optimization purposes, these can be chosen, chosen individually for each of the uh, individual ellipsoid singularities. <coughs> then we sum them all up over the entire group, and this is basically our definitive deformation. Uh, now here just two quick plots about the, the influence of the scaling parameters. These work as intended. Uh, the, the larger you choose uh, lambda, the further you go around the singularity, and you can make your 
your deformation broader or more narrow with AIJ. And surprisingly enough, although you can choose them all differently, in most situations you can get away with just setting them all equal to minus one half and uh, one million and already produce very nice results. <coughs> so, but there's one, actually there's one more aspect to it. So, from the, from the delta function that we have, uh, this basically translates into an expression like this when, when, you, when, you, um, when you evaluate the delta function. And <coughs> while you see that there is, it's not possible that you can pick up any singularity from, from the delta function in the real space, since we are doing a deformation where we escape the singularities going into the complex space, there might actually be singularities in complex space coming from, from this expression. And you might pick them up. So you have to do something. And uh, one way to deal with this is you introduce an overall lambda bar. So this goes before everything else that we have introduced up to now. And uh, there are now two conflicting, let's say, paradigms on how to choose this lambda bar. You may want to choose lambda bar as large as possible in, in order to stay away from the known singularities. But then, as said, there might be other hidden singularities coming from here that you then might pick up. So you want to choose lambda bar as small as possible. So what do you do? Again, we look at the on-shell energy. What we do is we take this deformation here and we plug it in. And then we see <coughs> that uh, we end up with a quadratic equation that we can then solve. And I give you the solution here. And now the important part is <coughs> you see that this thing is already imaginary. And when xi squared is larger than yi, then the entire expression will be imaginary. So then there's nothing to worry about. In this case, we can simply set the lambda bar to uh, to 1. Now, in case this is smaller than yi and xi also goes to 0, then we have a pole at square root of yi. And in order to escape this, we make this choice here to, to stay away from it. And then I, I have made this small graph to, to give you what happens. So most of the time, you're actually here and, and uh, there's nothing to worry about. Okay. Now, towards the numerical implementation itself. At the moment, we have a code which is written in C++. And it uses the numerical integrator CUDA from the Kuba library. And then, of course, this means that it can run on any machine on which the Kuba library is available. And our analytic values are produced by loop tools. And then the basic algorithm of the program is you read in the momenta and masses, which usually come from a text file. Then the code checks automatically where the ellipsoid singularities occur. It also checks where the hyperboloid singularities, singularities occur and it groups them. And then the integrator is called, <coughs> taking into account all of the results of the first three steps. And then what the user actually has to do is indicate to the program the number of external legs that you have and uh, the parameters of your contour deformation. If it might, if it's needed, there are actually cases where you don't. Ah. Okay. Uh, next, I'm going to present you the results. And uh, when I'm going to do this, there are actually two ways where the complexity is growing as we go through the results. And the first one is, of course, when you increase the number of external legs. So for duality, every time you do this, you go from n to n plus one you pick up an extra dual contribution and <coughs> you all of the involved contributions feature an extra dual propagator. This is actually really nice because uh, let's say going to more external legs is a systematic procedure and um, doesn't complicate things much. And the other thing that might render your integration function more complex is the presence of numerator. Let's say you have a tensor integral then, of course, you have to work a little bit harder. Ah, so first, let's have a quick look at the timings. 
So there's a big separation between points that don't need any deformation and points that need a deformation. <coughs> and you see that when you have a deformation, you typically need to throw more points. Oh, okay. There's... Yeah, so this is supposed to be... Okay, so there's a systematical... <laughs> yeah, there, so these are actually 5 times 10 to the 4, and again 5 times 10 to the 4, and these are 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6. Apparently I forgot this. Okay. <coughs> and again here these are 10 to the 6 uh, evaluations, and here again 4 times 10 to the 6, 5 times 10 to the 6, and 8 times 10 to the 6. So what you can... S yes, yeah, what you can see here is that, for example, for no deformation, <coughs> there's actually hardly any growth in calculation time due to more external legs. You just, let's say, need more time. Okay, it's really missing. You just need more time as when you have more evaluations because, for example, here this was 10 to the 5 and this is 10 to the 6, so then you need 10 times more time, of course, because you have more evaluations. But you might expect that it costs sufficiently more time or substantially more time because there is now more or more dual contributions and each dual contribution is more complicated. When you have deformation present, things are a little bit harder to do, but you can still see that even a tensor hexagon is calculated in something like a minute and a half, which is really fast. <coughs> okay, here I give you a small selection of uh, results for each triangle box and pentagon, <coughs> and you see that within the number of evaluations given, you can usually expect something like four digits of precision. And then something that you can also do is <coughs> you can do a mass scan where you have your uh, momenta, your external momenta are kept constant, and then you vary the mass within a certain region. And here we picked a triangle and we varied the mass around the uh, threshold and what you can see here is the real and the imaginary part, of course, and the red line is what Loop Tools says, which is an analytic program, and uh, the dots here are our, uh, the, the Loop Tree Duality, our program from Valencia, and you see they match really nicely, and uh, even here very close to threshold, and another nice property is that all of these points take the same two and a half seconds, so I think this is also really nice. <coughs> and then what you can also do is you go to the box level and this time you scan for the Mandelstam variable T and we did it by simply varying the external momentum P3 <coughs> and also there you can see that you get really nice agreement. <coughs> and then finally we also did uh, pentagons and uh, here this is again a mass scan but I want to point out that when we go from left to right, actually, what happens is that here we, st we start with two ellipsoid singularities here, and then every time the function has some of these kinks, this is where an additional <coughs> ellipsoid singularity opens up. And so we start with two here, and we end up with five, so this is really not easy at all. But still, we, c we get a nice agreement. <coughs> okay, then next thing to do is uh, tensor integrals. So in a tensor integral, what you usually have is you have the expression that you already know pl plus some extra numerator function, which is usually a function of the loop momentum L and some of the external momenta P. So in our case, what we often used a contraction of L and some external momentum. So for example, L dot P1 or something like that. <coughs> now, the most important thing here to note is that the presence of numerators will not spoil the cancellation of the hyperboloid singularities. And this is particularly important because you might fear that it happens and then you would have to work extra, but it doesn't. And so you can go straightforwardly ahead. And uh, while this numerator function at first is uh, the very same for, for the initial integral, once you apply duality, <coughs> the uh, the loop momentum L0, the energy component, gets fixed by the delta function 
And for every of the dual contributions, the index i counts the dual contributions, you will have a slightly different numerator function. So this is something just to keep in mind. <coughs> okay, and again, you see that uh, here I have uh, examples for boxes and up to pentagons, and still you get really nice agreement. Actually, for pentagon, well, loop tools only gives you uh, reference values up to pentagons, so for the hexagons, we use SecDec3, which is also a really nice program. So this is why you have here also the arrows. <coughs> okay, so then here we have another uh, triangle mask scan, and still it works as expected, although we have now here numerators involved. And uh, same story for the box, but in order to spice things up a bit, the numerator that we chose here is L.P1 times L.P2 times L.P3. And let's say once we vary the Mandelstam variable T by varying P3, we see that the denominator and the numerator are, are varied simultaneously, but still the program holds together well. And uh, in a similar fashion, we did it for the box, and this time we varied uh, the Mandelstam variable S, so the center of mass energy. And we did this by varying P1, and again we have the same numerator, and since P1 is also part of the numerator, this also picks up this variation, And uh, but still we see we get a really nice outcome. I would also show you a graph about uh, the hexagons, <laughs> but let's say SecDec doesn't less let you mass produce values and let's say output them in a systematical way so that you can then feed, it, feed them in into your other software. Okay, this, there we come to the conclusion. And uh, <coughs> the most important thing to take away here is that the loop tree duality lets us rewrite our loop integrals in terms of tree level objects. <coughs> and then the, the final goal is a holistic approach, meaning that we bring the loop and the tree contributions together and uh, treat them. Uh, simultaneously. This is not done yet here what, in what I showed you because this is just let's say a first step. But let's say one of, one of the closer next steps is, is really to, to bring things together. <coughs> and a nice property is this partial <coughs> cancellation of singularities among the dual integrals and especially for the mass zero case we had this restriction of the singularities into a finite region of loop momentum space. <coughs> and we could see that also, despite being an early version, it deals well with uh, scalar and tensor integrals. That's it. Thank you for your attention. So, questions, comments? The experts in the <laughs> <laughs> I have a doubt. When you use uh, uh, integration by parts identities to reduce uh, integrals with uh, denominators uh, mm -hmm. uh, rising to higher powers. Uh, it is always possible to get something like your original integral times a linear combination of master integrals with uh, uh, unique uh, denominators, let's say f1110 yeah. times a coefficient, a coefficient that uh, is free of epsilon points. I mean, if you go back to one of your yeah. Slides where you write uh, this F1 to um, such an example. Yeah, okay, this, this takes a time. Uh, here. Yes. There, there is a coefficient. You mean this one here? Yes. It, uh, if you take the limit epsilon to zero, yes. you are not introducing any extra pole. Uh, can you say? Uh, say uh, anything in general for these kind of uh, reactions? I mean, when you yes. take an integral, apply integration by parts, and can you conclude anything about the coefficients? And so, let's say there is no formal proof about this, but in general these uh, coefficients tend to be free of uh, these okay. problems, but there, there's no formal proof. But we qu calculated quite a lot of them and none of them had this problem. Okay. And let's say if it occurred, most probably you might be able to reduce to another basis where you, you don't have it. One question? 
please. Excuse me, could you speak a little bit louder? Exactly. Yes. But let's say it was my work to apply it to the one loop case. So this, this is just the beginning of the, of the method. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, this deformation is. I mean, I guess you can have many different choices of how to make the deformation at the end. In the sense, <laughs> are there other functions that satisfy the same? I mean, like this orthogonal to the. Yeah, yes, of, you, you could come this up. This is the most simple. Let's say that this is the one of the more simpler ones that we could come up with because, let's say, the. You, you have this very simple one-dimensional example and then you, you might think, okay, how can I transport this idea into three dimensions, satisfying all the conditions. And then we, we basically, this we construct a factor that is very sim similar to this exponential here and uh, something that is, in a sense, similar to the L here. Mm -hmm. Okay, but also you respect that this uh, deformation only happens in the imaginary part of the momentum. Can be also in the real part. I mean, the well, case is just in the imaginary part. Yeah. But in the sense, if you go back to the one with the k kappa function, you know, is there any possibility that your GD, your dual, yes. has a imaginary part and then it's no. start to. No, no, these dual propagators are purely real. We, we don't consider any, let's say, imaginary masses or any, any yeah. like this. Yeah, this is the, the other question, what happened with yeah. the no, no, imaginary we, masses or... No, you, you, uh, we, we, or we stuck to, let's say, real masses and real momenta. Okay. Yeah. But if, if you, I mean, <laughs> if in a future you extend it to imaginary masses, also you will have to uh, create, this create might these duals in order to satisfy them. This, this might be possible, although it's not a priority. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, just More questions? No comments? Please. Yes, I mean, like, it's both to the first sense. But I guess one that you showed you have that way. So how do you expect the, the calculation time to scale with two or three groups, let's say? <laughs> Very good question. So. Let's say for the two loops, we already saw that you have, let's say, more contributions. So I expect the cal calculation time to go up. And then, let's say maybe by a factor two or three, but I'm really speculating here. Because, because I haven't done any higher loop calculations. This, this is the first time that this method was implemented in the program at all. So. Yes, for example, uh, we have calculated, um, uh, for example, with uh, for the for the hexagons where we co compared to with SecDeck, because loop tools couldn't give us the values. Um, SecDeck takes for let's say two to three uh, digits of precision. For the rank three hexagons, it took SecDeck one and a half hours. And with our method, it was a couple of minutes, or one minute and, and a bit. With uh, when you have only a rank one numerator or rank two even, then SecDeck does it in let's say ten to twenty minutes, and we are still at one minute. So, let's say our tool is let's say much more limited in in its application because it does one loop, scalar and and tensor integrals, but that's it. And SecDeck is a much more, it is more like a Swiss army knife. It does much more things than, than we do. We are much more specialized in, in what we do. More questions? 
I have a good um, in the conclusion you were saying that you wanted to you want to to, to make the Monte Carlo Yes, yes, this is a priority. You you are thinking like Monte Carlo like Pitya or like uh, Macra or, or uh, more in which you can plug this inside the Monte Carlo or is just you produce the external legs and then you yeah, uh, make the um, showering and the part from so, so the so the idea is, I think that that you couple it to a Monte Carlo that then gives you the momenta and then you use the Lutri duality method to calculate your scattering amplitudes, or rather your your Feynman graphs, but you do it in such a way that you have this combined treatment. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, the most suitable Monte Carlo what would be? I mean, I don't know. I, frankly, I have no idea because I haven't used these Monte Carlos. Um, this, this is, let's say, a decision that my supervisor must take. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, okay, so I guess if there is no more questions, so we thank Sebastian again. Thank you.